If you always do good work from your standards, whether you're in a project that fails or succeeds, you can live with that. But if you're doing things on other people's criteria or standards and you fail, you feel terrible. There's nothing worse than failing on somebody else's idea. Fail on your idea or don't succeed on your idea. It, it hurts so much less. You go, well, I did my best, I tried, I had a good time. I, at least this happened, you could look at the glass half full. You know, you can do all these wonderful things if it's yours. Hey everyone, welcome to Impact Theory. Today's guest is one of the most iconic actors to ever grace the silver screen. One of the youngest leading actors ever nominated for an Oscar. He's received an Emmy, two Academy Award nominations, and six Golden Globe noms, including one win for Best Actor in a Musical or a Comedy. And out of all the actors they could have chosen, Variety honored him with their inaugural Cinema Icon Award at the Cannes Film Festival. And given his storied career, it is no wonder. A triple threat who has had a top 10 song, appeared on Broadway in smash TV shows, and era defining films, he has had one of the most lauded and enduring careers of any actor in history. He starred in two of the most successful films of the 70s, including Grease, which is the top grossing live action musical of all time. And he is so compelling on screen that culture literally changes in the wake of his movements. His career launching dance moves in the big screen phenomenon, Saturday Night Fever, tripled the sales of white suits, and his starring role in the hit film Urban Cowboy inspired a country music craze that swept the nation. And that is, I assure you, just the tip of a very large body of work that spans decades and includes some of the most memorable films ever made, including seminal works like Pulp Fiction, Blowout, The Thin Red Line, Get Shorty, Primary Colors, Face Off, Broken Arrow, and dozens more. His list of credits reads like a list of the all-time great films across most every single genre. So please, help me in welcoming the star of Fanatic, which is now available on VOD, the high school dropout who turned a deep passion for performance into one of the most astonishing careers in the history of cinema, the living legend, John Travolta. <laughs> Welcome, man. Wow. Welcome to the show. Tommy boy, what an introduction. What a career. Jeez, man, I, I just, I, I thought I want to meet that guy. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you very much. And thank everybody who's here uh, visiting uh, for the show today. The interesting thing, if I hadn't just spent the last 30 minutes with you, I would think that that was just sort of um, false humility, but you really do carry yourself like you don't realize you're John Travolta, which That's is amazing, deceptive. it's beautiful, and is actually really wonderful to see. And has got me in trouble. Being that low key about it? Yeah, because you know I'm from a working class family, and we are humble by nature, uh, and love the, the good things that we uh, succeed in in life. However, uh, you just become more of who you are when you get them because you can't forget your beginnings. So I, I literally forget any of that. You know, if I meet someone new, I don't think that they're clocking or registering that I'm anyone different than the guy they just met. <laughs> so your, your perception of that is actually uh, pretty correct. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it is a fascinating thing. So for Lisa and I, my wife, while on a scale so much smaller than yours, we had a similar transition, right? So come from a working class family that teetered between blue collar and white collar, and then generated real wealth, like the kind of wealth that changes my, not only my life, but my entire family's life. Of course. And you look at that and your whole world theoretically is different, but at the same time, Money doesn't, like it doesn't change how you feel about yourself. Right. And that's the thing that I found so interesting in my own journey and watching you, I'll even go farther and say the fame does not seem to have changed how you feel about yourself. And whenever you talk, you talk so much about the art. Mm -hmm. um, what, what has fame been like? How have you managed to keep art as the true north? 
uh, born into that because my mother was a, a drama coach. She was a director, she was an English teacher, a speech teacher, and she had a high integrity about theater and all of the arts. So all of us that got interested in her interest um, were held to a very high criteria of, of performance. So performance mattered, not fame, mm. not money. How well did you do at something is what mattered to her. And my father, who was an excellent athlete, he was a semi-pro athlete in basketball, baseball, and football. And so they were more about achievement, not so much about superficial things. And the interesting thing is that when you are honorable to achievement, the wealth and that kind of thing comes automatically. Mm. You don't have to worry. It's when you invert that, when someone wants wealth or they want, want fame, it, it's harder for that to happen because it's not based on anything that has a, a being exchange to it. If you're good at something- Define that, being exchange? Well, meaning that, that uh, if I make something that's of high quality, you'll mm -hmm. give me more beans for it. It's a- Beans, it's a, beans, it, got it, it's got a, it, it's a, it. It's a, it's a, you know, it's just an old fashioned expression, mm -hmm. but it's, it, what's the quality of what you're having worth? If, you know, if I make this cup really well, you'll pay maybe a little more for it than if I do a poor job of it. So your exchange has to be at a higher level and then it automatically comes, mm -hmm. but it's not what you're going for, in my, in my opinion. Now, yeah. now people could have done it. You know, I always say, if you wanna be uh, wealthy on, on just money, uh, get into the money business, uh, investments, uh, banking, you know. Uh, but if you're in the arts, I would do it for art's sake first, and then uh, hopefully others will follow, but not make it a prerequisite, but just keep doing the right thing and the good thing, it'll happen. I agree with that so aggressively. Um, so I chased money for nearly a decade. That was like, I woke up every day just thinking about getting rich. I wanna get rich and that's it. And the punchline of that was I ended up being sort of emotionally bankrupt and just really sad and like not having fun. I did not enjoy my life right. in the slightest. And so I went to my wife and I said, look, I know I promised I would make you rich uh, and I will, but I'm gonna need more time because I need to do something that makes me feel alive. Sure. And that was a, that was like eye opening, actually living the cliche of money can't buy happiness and sort mm -hmm. of finding myself in that conundrum. And then going back to what you're saying about the bean exchange, like, so I'm sure you're hyper aware of this one, your Instagram game is pretty strong. And then having a daughter who's like prime Instagram age. Yes. Um, so many kids now reach out to me and they, they aren't even asking me how I became successful as an entrepreneur. They wanna know how I built my following. And I'm like, dude, let me tell you, I built my following by putting my head down for 20 years and making a better cup, like learning how to do something that intrinsically yes, has yes. value, right? And when I That's look right. at your performances, dude, your, your career is so fucking insane, dude. And the reason it's insane is you've never phoned a performance in, in like, how long have you been acting? Wow. <laughs> I mean, it's like crazy. Acting since I was 12 years old, but, but uh, you know, I would say professionally since I was 16. So it's been quite a while, but... Uh, you're 100% correct because I, I, I always behave as though uh, my, my performance that I'm doing is, is not only the best role I've ever had, but the, maybe the last role. Mm -hmm. And even though I don't mean that literally, I have to think in that, in that frame of mind just so I do my best work, do you know? And I take, uh, I, I take every role as seriously as the next. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing a light comedy, I make sure that I'm as invested in that as I am a, a, a very well-written drama, let's say. It's interesting, so I came in, so when I saw Pulp Fiction, I was at film school. So I was studying film when that landed. And I mean, <laughs> Jesus, dude, like that blew up the film school. Like people were just freaking out. But I grew up on you in like the Look Who's Talking era. Yeah. And then my mom, who was sitting literally right there, which makes it so much more yes. fun for me, was a psychopath <laughs> for Greece. Uh, so yes. <laughs> I have uh, I have seen that many many times. Mm -hmm. So it was so interesting to sort of as I grew, I got to dip into your films in different time periods where the tonality of that film matched where I was as a human. So like seeing Saturday Night Fever, which is fucking gritty, and I think people forget how intense that yes, movie really is. Absolutely. How do you go about the selection process? How have you thought about it? Maybe as it changes over the the length of the career. Well, just as a, a global perspective on, on choices, uh, I, I've never planned the end result of what I was going to do, for instance. I, never, I, I didn't do Saturday Night Fever 
uh, thinking that I would start trends, do you know, <laughs> or urban cowboy knowing that I would start a trend. You do it because it's a good piece of work. You love it. You're going to do the best job you can. You're going to invest in, in research. You're going to drill and practice and get it right. And then whatever result it is, I mean, Senator Fever, for instance, I thought was a little art film. The only film I ever did that I felt had any absolute commercial viability was Greece because I had done the Broadway show and I saw the success with my own eyes. And I thought if we even execute this halfway as good as we did on Broadway and on the road, we're, we're in high cotton. But that's the only film. The others, who knows what, what will make. I thought Pulp Fiction was going to be Reservoir Dogs. I thought Saturday Night Fever was going to be Mean Streets. Honestly, so I, I, I didn't predict that. Mm -hmm. All I did was what we started this conversation with, guaranteeing good work as best I could. Now, there's some of it that's out of your control. You have a director, you have a writer, you have, um, you have uh, designers on the movie that could alter your intent, mm -hmm. but you are responsible for your aspect of it and as much uh, you know, cheerleading as you can with all the other departments. Uh, but you must always show up, uh, whether the end result is a good one or not as good, going full throttle and delivering the best product you can. And otherwise, don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. You know, it's, it's not about one foot on the shore and one foot on a boat. You commit. Just like today, I drove your, your beautiful crew, and they are beautiful. I'm, I'm, they're gorgeous people. But I drove them crazy because I wanted the lighting right for this interview. But that's part of my responsibility to, to, so I don't have any attention on it. I can talk to you, Tommy boy, directly without wondering whether, boy, is that, mm, I don't know about that. This doesn't feel right, but I can be here with you mm. and, and, and have my attention not on other things. Yeah, so talk to me about work ethic, man. Your work ethic seems insane. Hearing, um, some of the preparation that you did for like Saturday Night Fever, which of course I had to rewatch. And the, the dancing in that is crazy, man. You look like you're ready for the Olympics. Like it is, it is some <laughs> I approached intense it like, shit. And let me, give, let me give another actor a bit of the credit for that spirit. Because when I was starting out, Robert De Niro was with Scorsese doing very in-depth work you know, Raging Bull and, and Mean Streets and that whole early lineup of films that, you know, when he did New York, New York, we heard he practiced a year on the saxophone. We heard he, uh, you know, became a real fighter and all this. And then it suddenly gave permission, if you will, for us younger actors to commit at a new level. Not that we weren't doing that before, but it upped the game for everybody. So when I worked with him in the killing season, I said, I got to, I flew to Serbia and Bosnia and did my research, interviewed soldiers. And, and I came back with a stack of research that fills this room with recordings and to, to deliver an authentic performance. Cause I thought, well, here's, I'm going to do a movie with a guy that, that believes in that. So there was an important moment where we were given permission as a lot of young guys to, to go the distance because you had Pacino and De Niro going the distance differently than earlier actors had, other than, let's say, Marlon Brando, who always went the distance. You know? No question. Yeah. How have you managed to sustain that over a career? Like, you do see people that they can do it once or twice, but man, to, like, even now with Fanatic, it's so clear how much time and energy you put into that character, the mannerisms, the just really embodying it, and I think people will be shocked by the physical transformations. Um, how do you, why, why are you so hungry? Like, why do you keep doing this at this level? Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, that's what you, you have as evidence of a, a, a life well lived, uh, a contribution to people. You know, you, you know if, if, if let's say I have 70 movies and each one delivers a, a kind of joy to a, a certain audience, the collage or the mosaic, of your career has this blanketed effect that suddenly you can go away with pride that you, it was a job well done and you, you maybe made a difference in a lot of people's lives. You know, uh, when you see young fans with 
a tattoo of Danny Zuko or, or Vincent <laughs> Vega on their arm and you, and you say, this somewhere I made a difference in their life. Were they, were, was someone glad that you were alive? Were you valuable to someone uh, by being here? And you, you want to be valuable, you know, otherwise you're kind of wasting your time uh, if, if you don't find your niche to be valuable to something, mm. I think. <laughs> you really wear like that, the love, the sort of raw connection to the art um, on your sleeve in a way that I find is fucking enthralling. Like even now, like I can see in your eyes, like you were really hit by what you were just saying. Um, how do you connect with that? Is that just, you've always just been connected or have so, you found through acting a way to like open yourself to that, to, to draw in that purpose? Well, it's a fair question, but I believe that because of my family's commitment to the purity of, of the arts, we, we always, we just didn't ever want to be caught not being professional and not being good at what we were doing ever. That was more of a shame to our group as a family unit than it was anything else. Even in fooling around, improvising at home or creating humorous skits or skits. And you know, you, you, you either own that idea or you, you don't. And uh, we just had to, that was our survival mechanism was to be as good as we could at what we were doing, you know, or don't do it. There's a side to you though, that I, it's gonna be hard to put into words what I'm gonna try. And then I will get to a question at the end of this, bear with me. Sure, go ahead. So seeing you on Oprah, I've seen enough Oprah to, to <laughs> get a sense of like where she is with you. And she yes. was so effusive with how much she loved you and just felt like there was something special and she had a connection to you. Countless actors have said very similar things that, that you lift the set up, that, that you have this playfulness, this spirit about you. Um, dude, 40 plus years in the industry, I literally expect you to be cynical. And so the fact that you aren't, I don't buy is accidental. So I'm curious, like what you've done, how you've stayed, you've had ups, you've had downs in your life outside of this, you've had loss, like heartbreaking loss. And yet literally sitting across from you where I like to think you couldn't fake me out. I can feel the like, you actually love what you do. And, and I, I mean that in a big way. You, the way you were, you were kind. When you were changing the lighting, you were fucking up like holding signs and saying like, is this working? It's not like you were just telling other people to do it. Like there's a, you're, you're involved in your own life. I don't, I don't well, there's have a joy of, for it. There's a joy of creating and that's free. Whether you write or play music or act, you know, that's free. The joy, and you can splurge on that joy. Uh, everybody can. You just have to give yourself permission. It's like Wizard of Oz. You know, you click your heels. You always can go home when you can always create something. You know, if we were, if it was just the two of us and, you know, we finished talking and I said, you know, let's draw some pictures, man, or let's, you know, let's make a little movie or, you know, we could find something to do that might heighten the uh, awareness of being alive. Um, cynicism is always going to try to get you and it's your job to navigate around that cynicism. How? Because they're like nipping dogs at your feet. They're not important. Cynicism is valueless in my book. And I have no time for it. I will be patient with it to a degree. And then I have no patience for it. And I would love for you to have actually witnessed me on phones trying to make something happen and eliminate all the naysayers on the phone. Let's say a seven... Mm -hmm. Well, you know this from being in business. Seven people are on the on the phone, and three of them are lawyers, and two of them are managers, and three of them are agents. And I can like radar who are the people that are not for this. And I detect it. Whatever the person's name is, could you please remove yourself from this phone conversation? Because if you stay on, we're not going to make this deal. Mm -hmm. You get down to the people that want the show to go on the road. Mm -hmm. You got a deal. You have to get rid of the people who don't want to play the same game as you do. Dude, go, go harder on that. So one of the number one questions I get asked is, okay, so in, in sort of my space, whatever that is, you hear a lot that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Okay, so you say that enough, which I actually really believe. I also think it extends to ideas, but you get people saying, okay, but there's people in my life they're not lucky enough that it's an attorney or a manager or somebody, it's their mom, it's their cousin, it's whatever, their boss, their manager. And they have that person in their life and they can't just get rid of them. 
Do you have methods for dealing with Yes, that? you handle them. And you have to go, if you love brother, sister, mother, father, friend, a business associate, whatever degree you are committed to them and you don't want to uh, do that, they're different than just a professional person that's assumed a, 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 a beingness in your group then it's easy to eliminate if they're not wanting you to survive. Mm. But if you have people that you deeply love and you can't feel comfortable about that, you find a way, and it's artful, you have to find a way of handling each of them so everybody goes away feeling happy and not antagonized about your displeasure with them. Mm. So, you know, I could make up examples, but, you know, if you have someone who, you know, let's say I'm creating this idea, but some parent that doesn't want their kid to play the violin, okay? And they're antagonistic. You know, you've got to be an accountant. You've got to be an accountant. You go, okay, dad, I love you, but if I become an accountant, I'm becoming what you want me to be. And I have a good chance at having a not so happy life. Even if I fail at being a violinist, at least I failed on my own terms and I failed doing something I loved. So you gotta let up on me, dad, or brother, or sister, or whatever, whoever that character is that has a counter intention to you. You have to get with them and get real and say, look, it's my life, it's not your life, and this is how I need to do it, you see? So there's ways of handling it. You know, I gave, the first example I gave you was a high-end example because you're trying to close a deal. Mm. But there's many examples, whether, Someone wants to be a baseball player, but their parents want them to be a football player. It doesn't even matter if it's a, the wrong sport. You see, it's not your sport, mm. you know? And I've watched people do this my whole life. I've watched them, you know, you're, wow, you got to be a professional uh, football player for six months. Why didn't that work out? Well, because I never liked, I wanted to be a baseball player. Well, what, what happened? They said, well, my dad, wanted me to become a football player and I was really going on his wishes. Mm -hmm. you go, hmm. So if you had to redo history, you'd say, would I have told dad at that time, look, you know, you, I'm just enjoying this more than that. Can you let up on me? So there's all these interesting increments of how you give yourself permission and navigate around people that are counter your intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, and then sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes you go, I don't really care which way I do this or that. And you acquiesce to just keeping peace and, and good, good roads, uh, goodwill. And, and it doesn't matter so much. Other times it matters a lot because it's your personal destiny. Speaking of people being contrary to your wishes, was anybody weird about you dropping out of high school to pursue acting? Uh, only my dad for a minute. And then when he saw that I could make a living at it, he let it go like a hot potato. Really? All he cared about was that I could survive in life. And he wasn't sure without a diploma that I could. And I was saying, in my mind, I was saying, I'm not a scholar. So therefore, <laughs> I'm going to do luggage handling at LaGuardia, or I'm going to become a, what I do best, act, sing, and dance. Mm. So dad, let me get, I'm, I'm 16. I'm chomping at the bit, let me out of the stable. My mother, she had no problem with it. She said, let him go. Thank God he's got a target, he, what he wants to achieve. He's already got a manager and an agent, let him go. you know. And finally, I made a deal with him and I said, well, again, keeping the peace, I said, what if I just took the year off and, and possibly even did homeschool so I didn't miss any you know, credit? Mm. He said, good, and that lasted about a month. You know, I send him my assignments, and, <laughs> you know, and then I started to make money, and then he started to see how well I could do. Uh, so he was more, you know, he's six kids, working class. He wanted to make sure I was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So his was much more pragmatic. Mine was much more, no, I want to put my bets on my abilities that you guys have let me so beautifully have and nurtured since I was born, you know, you know, my parents would sit there, you know, in those days, everybody smoked. He had a cigar. My mother would have a cigarette, a glass of wine. And they would watch me for three hours, lip sync records and improvise and imitate people and whatever. And they would look 
he's something, isn't he, boo? You know, he, uh, look, at, uh, can you believe how they made me feel like I was God's gift to the arts? So it's like, really, dad, you, you encouraged all this love of my performing, and now I want to do it. He just wanted me to be protected by a mm. diploma. I don't know how much that diploma was going to protect me, <laughs> you know, when you're auditioning for a Terrence Malick film. All right. You seem to have done okay without it, yeah. I would say. <laughs> the, the jury's in. It worked out. Uh, you embody characters with swagger so well. It's crazy from, obviously, Saturday Night Fever to Grease, but even like Vincent Vega in Pulp Fiction or in Get Shorty. What were you like when you left high school? Did you have a swagger like that? Because there is, there are people that have an it factor. And I really think that is, it's the hardest thing to talk about and maybe the most important thing in somebody when you're thinking about casting them. Did you have that? Were you able to convey it? Or did you step in to meet people in a character? Well, there's a few angles that you're approaching there. So the first one I'll address with the only swagger I ever had as a, as a, a child and as a teenager is that I, I like to dress well. And that was unusual, meaning I wanted to look like a beetle. I wanted to look like George Chikaris in West Side Story. I wanted to look like Warren Beatty in uh, 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 Bonnie and Clyde. So I would save up very little money that I had to look pretty swift. But I, I, it wasn't necessarily like I was acting that way. I just liked how that illusion looked, you see. Now, as far as the swagger. My generation was at the tail end of the beginning of what cool was. You had Marlon Brando, James Dean, uh, Paul Newman, uh, Warren Beatty creating cool. These illusions, the Beatles were, those, they were cool. So as a child, you're absorbing what you think cool is. It's not necessarily that you're behaving like them, but you're a registering somewhere what cool might be. So you get a role like Danny Zuko in Greece and <laughs> you're gonna apply all that. Whether you are that or not, no, I'm not. But I grew up with a family of artists so I can apply it very easily. What I observed in, in what was seemingly the, the effect of what cool was. So it's an affectation within the confines of a character if that makes sense. Yeah, Just definitely. like with the fanatic, he's anything but cool. You see, because I understand that character. So I'm going to be honorable to the attributes of that character only. I don't cross collateralize characters. You have an obligation to be that guy. If it includes cool, like let's say Saturday Night Fever, Grease, Pulp Fiction, or, be, or, or Get Shorty, it includes cool, but that doesn't mean every character. It, it, it just happened to be that those needed that. Mm -hmm. Do you see? Yeah, definitely. You've said that the characters that come closest to you are from Phenomenon or Michael, and you specifically said it's it's some of the things that they say and stand for. What are those things that they say and stand well, for? Well, Phenomenon, that... the, his emotional uh, life is very much like mine. You know, I don't want to break anyone's heart. I believe in not doing anything that someone else can, can't handle very easily. You know, if, if in the love world of loving your children, loving your wife, loving your friends, I'm respectful of the effect I have on them. Like that character was respectful of the effect that, you know, separate from business. This is personal. Okay. Um, business I'm much different about, but, but personal, I, I, to some degree, and it's hurt me, worn my heart on my sleeve, but I won't take it off my sleeve. I don't believe in that. So there's that. And as far as just behavior, let's say the character in Luke is talking was kind of like how I talk and how I, my humor and that kind of thing. So there's only a few roles that I've, I've actually felt that were kind of like me, but the rest is 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 just just my obligation to the attributes of that character. What is one of your defining characteristics? Like in your own mind, the thing maybe you're most proud of or that you think is the, the core of who you really are? 
probably that I deeply care at an unusual level for another human being. And I have the ability to take responsibility for them completely, even if they're not able to take responsibility for themselves. And not that I'm not artful about who I choose to do that with, but I do have an uncanny ability to look at every angle to make sure something is completely taken care of. And, and I've had moments where people have done that for me, but I think that's probably what I, my stable concept of myself is that I, I'm willing to, to the greatest degree I'm capable of, take responsibility for others. That's very interesting. It triggers notions in my mind about empathy and what makes humans so uniquely capable of the level of empathy that we have. And then sort of playing that out in my mind about what makes you such a great actor, the ability to sort of understand where they're coming from, relate to them, feel connected to them. Is that sort of all part and parcel yes, of? I think so. And even when I'm playing an, an evil character, like I did in Broken Arrow or, or um, aspects of Pulp Fiction or... Um, well, you name it, there must be a dozen uh, guys that I've played that, that have that aspect to them. Um, I don't have to even like those characters. I just have to like playing them. Mm -hmm. I have to be entertained by them. So if I think I can get a kick out of playing a bad guy and you'll find it humorous and uh, insightful to and entertained by it, then I will gravitate toward it. So... Sometimes I, you know, there's a dichotomy there where my empathy doesn't go for the evil in a person, but goes for what, what's entertaining about their evil, <laughs> you know, what makes me laugh about their evil. And face off, mm -hmm. you know, it was so much fun because those char the evil part that both Nick and I shared uh, was, was hilarious. At the same time, it was evil. Do you know, so you, you don't get the, the impact on the audience doesn't isn't appalled by you as much as they're entertained by you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to balance the impact of uh, an evil character when you're doing that. You know, good guys are good guys unless they're falsely good. It's more of a pretense of some sort. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to what you were saying about taking responsibility for people. So recently heard an interview with your daughter, who is also an actor, um, late teens, if I'm not mistaken. 19 now. 19. And when asked about you and if you ever embarrass her or anything like that, she was effusive in her praise of you. Like it's very clear that um, you guys have a phenomenal relationship. Normally a child at that age is really trying to distance themselves from their parents, rebel back a little bit, but she really seemed like, no, 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 I'm like this has been wonderful. Yeah. Um, how have you accomplished that? Um, what are some values that you carry into that dynamic? Well, look, I'd love to take a lot of credit for Ella and Ben, but I can't because I think truly they are innately incredibly wonderful human beings. And whether Kelly and I set examples here or there, that's fine. Or whether the people that were around her set good examples, possibly. But the innate quality of a human being is their quality as a human being. And she's just a sterling human being, as is Ben. Incredibly understanding, incredibly tolerant, patient, ethical, and gorgeous people. You know, they're, they're, I'm so proud of them. You know, and I, I really give them the credit more than I give myself anything. You know, I, I'm there and I'm, I take full responsibility for them, but they're responsible for their own personalities. You know, I mean, I'm sure your mama, she's sitting there, might agree that my mom would violently disagree with you. I'm telling you right now, that woman is like you taking full credit for everything him? I've ever done. She's like, I raised you right. <laughs> so, and in her defense, like I, I actually do come at it that way. Cause I think that, um, you know, going back to Ella, I think that it's very different to be a good person than to have effusive praise for your father. So you're not a neutral force in her life. So while I'm happy to grant that she is, um, just she is just a wonderful person. Okay, with great well disposition. then, then I'll, if if I had to uh, give myself any credit for her gorgeous being, it would be my patience, tolerance, and understanding of both my children as children. 
I've never hit them. I've never, I've never uh, made them feel bad or insulted them. Nothing. Never nullified them ever. I just treat them like my parents treated me, which was with with an enormous heart, enormous tolerance, and enormous and enormous patience. And trust me, they're nothing like I was. I was something to be, you know, dealt with, because I was I was demanding. You know, and I was everything I am now, but in a little body. <laughs> and you see me running around here fixing the lighting. Well, imagine what my parents went through. You know, <laughs> at with a little body telling them, orchestrating what they're going to do. And how much know. so do you think that's helped you? Like, there's uh, so in my life, the lesson I had to learn was to toughen up. So I grew up very soft. I um, I would get hit in the leg with a soccer ball. Now I grew up in Tacoma, so it's cold. But I would cry and walk off the field and nobody ever said, hey, get the fuck back on the field or like pain something yeah. you lean into. Like, and I get it. And I know when people hear that, they're like, oh, you should never say that. But literally, I couldn't be successful until I faced that stuff and could push through pain and I learn understand. how to deal with it and all that I stuff. Understand. So I'm going to guess that one, to say on a phone call, I'm going to need you to excuse yourself from this phone call. No matter, no matter how much control you have in the relationship. Dude, you, you're an empathetic person. Like everything about you exudes empathy. So I know you know what that feels like. Even if he's being a dick, even if he is the problem, being willing to say you have to get off the phone is powerful. So while I'm sure it may have been at times troubling for your parents, do you think that's been useful as a tool in your arsenal? Yes, because one should never confuse kindness with weakness, ever. Because just because a person's kind or wonderful or loving or patient or tolerant doesn't mean their cup not runneth over at the right time. And when my cup runneth over, especially when it, it's so clearly cut that what I'm trying to do is keep a boat floating and they're trying to sink it, I have no tolerance for that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm talking about, is more about that subtlety, is that I'm all that and a bag of chips when it comes to empathy and tolerance and patience. But if you are trying to bring, to sink a, a, a boat that has a lot of people that have good intentions and of, are good uh, are, or are of good will, and now you're trying to take that away from all of them, I will fight you on it, you see? Because you're not doing the survival thing for that particular group. Mm -hmm. So you can keep your sentient, if you will, concepts about yourself. But at the same time, you have to be strong enough to, otherwise you will fold. You can't do this like a, 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 a bull in a china shop. That doesn't work either. You, you can't just be unthinking about every move you make. You have to, you don't pull those moves of extremity until you see the real intent of something, that someone's really trying to destroy something. And you have every right to handle that, mm. I think. What do you hope your daughter learns from your career? Are there certain um, missteps that you'll point her to and say, hey, here's how to better handle this? Are there certain things you did that set you up for wonderful things and say, hey, make sure you do this? I've only instilled one idea. Always commit to your work at a deep level and do all the homework and research that you need to do to portray a great role. Don't do material. You have a luxury. You're, you're not where I was, you don't have to do material that's not up to your abilities. You know, I've had to do jobs sometimes where I had to rise above the material in order to make it a, a good performance. But my goal was still to make it a good performance. Mm -hmm. She may not have to do that. So she could be discerning and luxurious about what she chooses. And, you know, if you always do good work from your standards, whether you're in a project that fails or succeeds, you can live with that. But if you're doing things th on other people's criteria or standards and you fail, you feel terrible. There's nothing worse than failing on somebody else's idea. Fail on your idea or don't succeed on your idea. It, it hurts so much less. You go, well, I did my best. I tried. I had a good time. I, at least this happened. You could look at the glass half full. You know, you can do all these wonderful things if it's yours. But man, you, you start playing someone else's chess game and you feel terrible and it's like, oh man, what sh I shouldn't have done that. 
I shouldn't have let them influence me at that level. Mm. When things get hard for you, when you're having one of the difficult times, when you're trying to get in shape, when you're learning the dance moves for Saturday Night Fever, when you're doing something that's really hard, it's really taxing you, what do you do mentally to stay focused, stay strong, and get through it? The global uh, view of the end product. What's your valuable final product on anything? Keeps you going. You know, what's the end result? I'm going to get this routine. I'm going to get that accent down. I'm going to... Under, I want to really grasp the behavior of that character and your, your end game keeps you going because you, you have a goal. You've accomplished some pretty extraordinary things outside of filmmaking. It's very interesting when you were talking just now, I was thinking about you know one of the ways I know that you've dealt with um, challenging times in your career anyway has been to live life, as you said, to just go and embrace, take adventures um, and go do other things. Because life is an art. You can't forget that life is an art. This is why Oprah and I connected immediately because, you know, we did a whole episode one time on enlightening people that didn't have money on how they can live art. art. I said, very easy. I said, can the average fellow go to Walmart and afford a, let's say, a tray? Yes, it might be $3. Can you afford a cup instead of a paper cup? Might be a dollar. It's fine. Now, can you put your favorite coffee in that cup? Can you can you go to a market or something and get a nice blueberry muffin? Can you make that look pretty? Put a flower on that tray. Now, can you go give it to your husband or your wife? They'll think they're at the five, the Four Seasons, getting room service, and you have minimal money. It's how you approach it. Mm. You know, it's it's the art of life. If you want to look a certain way, it doesn't take money. I, I remember I had a couple of friends that were in a bind. They needed a suit for um, a wedding. They didn't have one. I said, let's go to Walmart. I said, I can get you a suit for $46. That will, it's going to look great on you. And it did because the designer of the Walmart thing had a better tailoring than some of the top designers. And everybody complimented him at the wedding, man. Yeah, you look great. You look great. Never told them it was from Walmart, $46. But he upstaged everybody with all their designer suits. Mm -hmm. I did that with my sisters once. I never told them. I was used to buying them expensive clothes. I went to Walmart and bought a cocktail dress for one sister and a, a kind of other type of cocktail wear. They wore them out. They love them so much. And I never told them how much they cost, $19 each. <laughs> <laughs> and I never told them where I got it from because I did not want it to influence them. But I wanted to show that you can experience life if you're clever with money and still be as artful. It's interesting. I'm, I am so in agreement with you. And I think that people get hung up on the money and don't realize what you're saying about doing it artfully. One thing that I found really interesting in researching you specifically for Fanatic is mm -hmm. you were talking a lot about um, that. So Fanatic, the main character that you play is an obsessed fan. And you said to play an obsessed fan, I need only think about how I have been obsessed yes. with other people in my Correct. own life. And there's something about your ability to be inspired by other people. Um, who are some people that have really inspired you, especially if it's somebody that we might have heard of? Um, and how do you capture that and not have like a professional jealousy about it? Well, my earlier inspirations were, for instance, Jimmy Cagney. And I was five years old watching Yankee Doodle Dandy, and he just rocked my world, you know, to the degree where my mother, if she pretended Jimmy Cagney was on the phone, She'd get me to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I bought it because we're, we're a show business family. My sister was on Broadway with uh, doing the Broadway tour with Ethel Merman and Gypsy. It's like my mother could very well know Jimmy Cagney, even mm -hmm. though she didn't. Right. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that that, that affected me. Uh, the Beatles affected me deeply. Uh, uh, there's certain movies I grew up with that La Strada, Fellini's La Strada, mm -hmm where Julieta Messina's character affected me deeply because she died of a broken heart. And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't comprehend that someone could die from something non-physical. 
and I you know, decided then at four or five that I would never want to break someone's heart. You know, th those are the kinds of impacts. So from an early age, you know, watching Gene Kelly in American Paris, you know, watching West Side Story, uh, all these films that had great impact, you it's you collect these inspirations and you start and you stand on their shoulders and then you perform with all of them in you to a greater or lesser degree. You have to be a fan. You won't make it if you're not a fan. I will put money on any great artist or great ball player or great business person had a secret obsession with someone they were admiring in that profession and just wanted to emulate, wanted to them to love them, they would love them. They'd be entranced by everything they 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 did, and and you know. But it, it's limited in your ability to express it, unless you're a girl that watching the Beatles and you're screaming. Nobody was inhibited then, <laughs> but but for most average guys, let's say they would have uh, uh, lead lives of quiet desperation over their admiration of Mickey Mantle, or you know. Or, or Jimmy Cagney. I was in a theater family, so I could express it a little more freely. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to be a fan in order to, uh, I think, have the the jolt of life in you to expand on it and give to others what they gave to you. Dude, that to me is one of the things that has served me so well in my life is I can let awe in. I can allow myself to be in go. awe. And there's something to, I think people, you, you said it really well when you talk about guys living quiet desperation over Mickey Mantle, um, you know, or in today's language, A-Rod or somebody right. like that, you know, it's like, fuck, they, they want to say something, they want to have that connection. And I think it speaks to why fandom has become such a thing. It's, it's mm -hmm. people having this relationship with something yes. that allows them to, yes. to sink into, like you said, the people who get the tattoos, right? You affected them in some way. But what's interesting is some people then really make it a part of who they are so that they can continually get that impact. Absolutely. Which I find that really interesting. And they need to, to keep it going. Mm. It's 100% yep. it's, uh, accurate. The grease in the frying pan. That, that is a really interesting thing. And I think if, when people can open up and when I look at the trajectory of your career, and I think this is somebody who has continually kept the grease in the frying pan, whether it was, hey, I've, I've had enough of acting for the moment, I'm gonna go get my pilot's license, right? Yes, yes. And, and that I find so interesting. And how much is having multiple passions a protection emotionally against something going wrong in acting, which is traditionally, I have a hypothesis, I'll, I'll ask it another way. Yeah. My hypothesis is this, your career is the extraordinary thing that it is precisely because you have a stable home life and you have a passion for flying. So you have these other things that would fulfill you and so there's, you're never walking into a situation with any air of desperation. Absolutely. You have to balance the playing field within your own thing. So when I was on Broadway and I wasn't enjoying the experience my second year and I was I was done with doing that same show every night, I was kind of depressed over it. Having a brochure about an airplane that I could build got me through that year. You see- You actually and, built the airplane? No, I wanted to. My mother called it a flying coffin. And, she, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, mom, that's not, your spirit, you know, because she'd always love, she loved flying and she loved that, but she didn't want me to build my own flying, which I understand. But it got me through, even though I didn't do it, it got me through that year because I was in the doldrums. And it gave you something to dream about? This feels important. It gave you something to dream about, something to do. I wore that brochure out, just imagining being in it, imagining flying. It just got me through. So. Yeah, that, that's always been a, 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 you know, when I did, uh, got my jet license, it was because I'd been in four months or five months on blowout in the dead of winter in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and it was very brutal, and I needed a break. And an officer and gentleman was written for me by the same guy who had done Boy in the Plastic Bubble. And I turned it down twice, because if I can't be there at the level we've discussed mm -hmm. earlier, I don't, you know, I don't do one step on the shore and one step on a boat. So I said, I would be in a maybe, I'm not doing it. I'd rather go enjoy life, learn how to fly this jet and accomplish something that way, 
get a little bit of respite from the stress of, of filming. And by the time I came back, which was Urban Cowboy, I was revitalized. It was, it was great. So as you look forward, I mean, look, you, you've had an insane career. You still look fantastic. Even Thanks. up close, man, I'm telling you, like, it's crazy. I actually want to punch you. Um, <laughs> writing your intro, I was like, fuck this guy. Like, <laughs> sings, dances, acts, has a crazy career. Obviously, at this point, you never have to work again. So when you think about that you've got so much, you know, juice left in the tank, like, it's pretty clear, like, you're showing up to your latest film, fucking on fire, doing your thing. Um, what... What's it about? Like, what do you want to achieve? Is there a genre you want to tackle? Is there just, no, just more, keep doing it, more varied Yeah, because I can't, you know, half the things I've ever done, I couldn't imagine that I would have done them. You, you, if, I don't know, 30 years ago, if you said to me, there, one day they're going to want you to play the President of the United States, primary colors. Uh, one day they're going to want you to play a, a very large woman <laughs> in a musical, not even identifiable, and you're going to help it make be a big hit. And I like being a muse for I love I love people shopping for their performance in their writing. Like in other words, like, you know, what actor can I shop for that would fulfill as a muse my writing and pull it off? I love that I'm ambidextrous enough to say, okay, yeah, yeah, I got a lawyer here somewhere. I got a, I got a, a hitman here. I've got a president in the back of my pocket. Oh, I even got a very large woman in the back of my <laughs> thing. I love having that ability to service um, that. I don't normally ask people about legacy. I don't think a lot about legacy in my own life. Um, do you think about legacy? Uh, only in the terms of simplicity. Like, uh, you know, do, were people glad that you're alive? Did you help them? Did you contribute to life? Did you, uh, it, was, it, was it worth your stay here, you know? Uh, can you say that? Mm -hmm. What level it's at or how people interpret it is really uh, up to them. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to say to yourself, did you achieve those things? And with me, uh, I have the good fortune of people showing me right there in present time what what I've done for them. You see, so uh, like like Jimmy Cagney must have felt when I met him, and I said, "I I just love you," and he started to cry. He was 80, 80 years old, and he started to cry, and I thought he's crying over my telling him I loved him, and. Uh, we were, we were friends for five years until his death. I get that a lot, you know, where people are telling me what I mean to them. So I'm a, 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 a be a little bit of a fool if I didn't take it to heart to some degree and say I mattered to them. And I'd like to continue to matter to them. That, that keeps me going, you know, you, you, cause relevant, or being relevant is, is, a, is a subjective thing. You know, you're always relevant. It's how you connect those points to continue to be relevant. And maybe you're relevant in your own way. Maybe you're relevant in only a certain audience's way. It doesn't matter. You're connecting and you're continuing. Mm. God, I blabbered a lot this. No, man, it's, been, it's been nice. <laughs> don't, I don't want to lose you yet because there's, there's, and I'm asking this question in absolute sincerity. May I first compliment you on your very interested and lovely person Thank you, man. and you have very good questions and they're very well thought out they're very smart and they're thoughtful and i appreciate it a lot man that's so meaningful and so kind and as a True. student of filmmaking uh, which is my first love by the way is film i can um, see that yeah i i have been moved by your work uh it's it's astonished me it's inspired me i mean wow. it's it's really incredible man like we were look it, it 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 is hysterical i wish we had a camera here pointing out so people could see how many fucking people are here watching this um <laughs> we've never had this many people sit in on an episode before thank you all right man where can people see fanatic where can they find out more about you where do you want them to join you well i mean the, the fanatic is my latest project i'm very proud of it um I think it's one of the roles that I disappear in the most that I've ever done. Uh, I disappeared as Edna, Edna and Hairspray pretty good. 
uh, and in primary colors I disappeared pretty good but you know I really feel like uh, this is a a very complete performance and uh, I I think it's also entertaining it's a very entertaining movie it's very original and unusual and I like the idea that in this day and age of film where we've had a hundred plus years of it it's hard to find something different to watch mm. this is really different this is it's an original movie like Pulp Fiction was. It won't have ever have the commercial value of Pulp Fiction, but neither did I think that would when I did it, you know. Uh, so, but anyway, I, I, I'm I really, uh, really proud of it. And uh, I, I was very, uh, I got a Best Actor Award in Rome for the performance. And I was very proud of that, out of the blue, that it was recognized. And I thought, wow, this is so random that, this beautiful and a very important film festival, by the way, acknowledged that performance. Mm -hmm. So uh, it 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 equaled what I put into it. The Bean Extended is beautiful there, you know. Definitely, and that's available on video on demand right now, yes. so people can stream it. Um, what is the impact that you want to have on the world? I want it to have been valuable that I was here for people that I. Actually, they're glad I was alive, that I helped somehow. I was valuable to them, whether it got them through a day, a week, a year, a month. Whatever I did, I just want to, my legacy was that I made a difference. Mm. And that, that's really it, you know. And entertained at a, a big level, which is what I, my intention always from a child was to entertain. That's why I had no problem with arguing with my dad about leaving to do it. I knew that was my destiny, was to entertain people. Mm -hmm. And I had the tools. So that's probably, you know, all, all that in capsule. I'll take it. Tommy, you did yeah. such a good job. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Yeah. That was absolutely thank wonderful. You. I thank all of you for all right. being here. Guys. <laughs> Basically, anything this man touches, you should be diving into. His Instagram is on point, by the way. Watch his entire <laughs> film catalog. You will not be let down. This is somebody who always shows up, performs at their best. Absolutely amazing. There's a reason that this guy is an icon. Aww. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Yay, Tommy. Dude, that was amazing. You're so awesome. Thank you so you much. You really are. There's always another race truck. There's always another game. So Take your game and ratchet it down just a drop, and you're going to have another game. And he was right. I didn't listen to that. To me, winning was everything.